But first, of course, we have to get the Malachi McCourt Christmas uh, <laughs> story told. <laughs> I well, Christmas. Um, it is. I often wonder about breaking down the, uh, the 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 term Christmas. Is it Christ Mass? And I'm not sure exactly what that uh, means. But it, it is supposedly the birth of a little fellow called Jesus Christ. And I never knew the uh, his parents' surnames. But they were Mary and Joseph, and I don't know what their names were. But Christ is a uh, is a Greek name, so I don't know how he ever got that name. Uh, when I was growing up, um, I think as people, some people might know, my brother wrote a book called Angela's Ashes, which told the story of our family. And uh, we are in Brooklyn at the moment, and this is the borough of my birth where Margaret Mary McCourt died, uh, 1934, uh, which caused my mother to have a some sort of a breakdown, mental, nervous, as they called it in those days, and my father went off uh, drinking. And that uh, got us to go to Ireland. Uh, friends, neighbors, and relatives got together, gave us the money, and we went to Ireland in 1934. Uh, Mother, father, Frank, myself, twin boys, Eugene and Oliver. Um, and when we got to Ireland, within two years, the twins died. They were four years old. Eugene and Oliver died within six months of each other. So Limerick in Ireland was not a very cheerful, glad place for us to be as we moved from slum to slum and misery and poverty, death, disease, despair, were the order of the day. And then my father got the Irish divorce. He disappeared into England and uh, leaving my mother with uh, two more kids had arrived in the meantime. So that was Christmas was always sort of uh, a time of great expectation. And we often, and they would tell you, you will get, what you pray for <clears throat> if you are a good boy. And uh, when I hear people saying, when it was people say, how are you? People always say here, good. And I have to correct them. I've corrected my own children and grandchildren. You're not good. You might be well, but good is totally subjective. So I was never, nobody ever said, you're a good boy, Maliki, Junior, whatever my name was at the time. So anyway, that was so anyway, good. Well is the word, not good. It's totally subjective. But anyway, um, so one, one Christmas, years and years and years and years ago, when I was about seven, so that is uh, 77 years. So two years ago, I was talking to a journalist who was asking me about my life and the writing and all of that and the wonderful things that have happened to me in America. And he said, what was Christmas like in Ireland? Chuck Wally was the lad's name. He was a journalist from the Adirondack Press. And uh, so I said, well, I remember when I was seven, and I told this story quite recently, several times actually, and our friend John McDonough said, I must tell it on the air today. So thank you, John. And um, we'll talk more about John later. But anyway, uh, I prayed and prayed and prayed, and I, then I went down to Todd's uh, department store, and in the window was a uh, train, a lovely train with give puffs of smoke, and it drew a whole lot of carriages with tiny little people looking out the windows in great expectation of going home for Christmas. And there were little hills, and there were little uh, signals, and little red lights, and there was little platforms, and little people standing on them, and there were tunnels, and it looked like that train was going somewhere, and a whole lot of people were happily headed for those wonderful holidays that everybody in the world had except us. Uh, you can be assured that Santa Claus has no time and never visits poor people. Santa Klaus, who came St. Nicholas, is a total capitalist. He doesn't give a fiddler's fart about uh, the poor people. But in any case, I was told that if I prayed, I might get uh, what I wanted. So looking at this train, I used to visit that train as if it were mine. 
And then I tried to go into that store to uh, to talk to Santa Claus, who I heard was in there. And this big guy in a uniform standing there said, get the hell out of here. He used another word, actually, beginning with F. We don't want you to sort in here, you little gutter snipe. And they uh, refused to let me in because I was snotty nosed, my scabby eyed and dirty and smelly as uh, many slum kids were, and he wouldn't let me in. So my only recourse then was to go to the church and pray. So I went to the Redemptorist Church, and they told us, if you pray, you will get what you pray for. So they had a crib there, what they call a crib. We called it, you call it a creche. And uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jesus were there, the mother and father, and the animals that breathe on Jesus when he's born to keep him warm. And um, so I knelt down there and I knelt and I prayed and prayed and prayed for about maybe, it must have been three or four hours I was there anyway, kneeling on a marble step behind a marble uh, fence kind of thing that was in front of the ch- in front of the crib. And I talked to the mother and the father and Jesus hadn't arrived yet because it wasn't Christmas. And the funny thing about her, Mrs. Jesus, she didn't look the slightest bit pregnant a tall, lissom, very slim figure. So, but I didn't know anything about that. It only struck me later on that she didn't look preggers at all. But in any case, I prayed. So finally, a priest came out and he said, what are you doing there? And I said, I'm praying, Father. What are you praying for? I said, I want to get a train. Get out of here, he said. So he threw me out of the church. And uh, so there was two throwouts, one from the, uh, the guy at the store and the other was... Uh, the the uh, sitting uh, out, out, out of the church. So anyway, um, I went home, and it was about three days before Christmas, and uh, I prayed, and I thought about that train night and day for all of that time. And uh, then Christmas arrived and went into our, our abandoned kitchen, <laughs> where there was usually a couple of slices of bread and a cup of tea. And uh, there was, I think, in my torn stocking, I think there was an apple and a penny and no train. And that was my uh, Christmas morning. And the beginning of my disassociation from Holy Mother Church. Uh, So then they pointed out to me, of course, you must not have been good. You must not have been uh, behaved yourself over the years. So... uh, that was the reason why Santa did not visit me or Jesus didn't intervene and give me the toy train. So telling this story to um, Mr. Wally, I, um, uh, I, I, telling the story to him uh, brought it all back to me. I'd totally forgotten it. And, uh, but he wrote it up anyway. A few weeks later, uh, just before Christmas, he called me and said he was in town and that he was um, going to have lunch at the Oyster Bar at Grand Central Station. Would I have lunch with him and his wife and son? I said, fine. He said, would you bring Diana with you too? And Diana is my beloved wife who just had a birthday the day before yesterday. And uh, I said, sure, I'll do that. So we went down to Grand Central Station to the Oyster Bar. They have a lovely lunch there. They did anyway. I don't know if it's still open. And he said, uh, oh, I have to go to the museum. There's a train museum, which I didn't know about, in Grand Central Station. So I sa- he said, oh, will I wait? And he said, no, come with me. So we went to the museum, and we went in, and there were a big crowd of people in there. And all of a sudden, people jumped jumped up shouting Happy Christmas and lights were flashing and there was a TV camera in my face and then a man stood up and he said his name was Bill Davidson, I think he said his name was, and he said, I I am the vice president of Lionel Trains and he said, we have gotten word that uh, you prayed for a train, a toy train for Christmas and Lionel Trains have heard your prayer, and they would like to answer your prayer. 
So we are giving you your toy train for Christmas. And he presented me with a beautiful little electric toy, big toy train with lots of tracks and all of that. So here it is, 75 years later, and you were, is that prayer answered? 75, does it have to be answered right away? Or do I just say thank you very much to whoever? And that it was not Santa Claus came, but Lionel Trains came. So I got my train, and I have that, and it's set up for my grandchildren. And, uh, well, all I can say is that I, I'm extremely grateful and it makes a lovely story, and it is absolutely true, but I've stopped praying. <laughs> that's, that's, quite, that's quite a story. That's, that's really incredible. So you still have the train. I have the train. It's I mean, beautiful. is it set up? Do you? It's all set up now for Christmas. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Right. So did this make you a firm believer and participant in Christmas, or what? No. No, it did not. I mean, look, when the only it, it has to be then. If it wasn't, it didn't happen when I was seven. What the hell is the use of it happening when I'm 84 or 80 or whatever the hell I was? 80. Right. What, what old was I? It was 82, I think. Yeah. So here was uh, 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 75 years later. 70. Yeah, th there it was. Right. It was, uh, it was uh, I, the, the disappointment at that time. It was devastating because the work I put into. And, and people say... Uh, and I'm always telling people when they're when somebody dies, they're always saying, "Our thoughts and prayers are with you." I say, "Just hang them in your lavatory and send money, right. Right. <laughs> or bake yeah. a cake, or do something." I cannot stand that phrase. And all the Republicans, I don't think for, whenever something happens, that our thoughts, as if they're doing something, you know. Yeah. And it's they're you totally useless. So knock it off. Do things for people. Take action. Yeah. That's, that's what we need. 